The top stories, a woman is shot dead, warnings over land use in area earmarked for development, and the Wendy's men and women advance at the World T20 in Bangladesh. Welcome to Nation News for Thursday, April the 1st, 2014. At Courts, every day we bring affordability, convenience, innovation, and style to over 1 million customers in 11 countries. From homes to communities, we are proud to make a difference in the lives of many across the region. Courts, bringing value home. A 22-year-old woman has been shot and killed in Babies Lane, St. Michael. Reports indicate that the shooting occurred just before 6 o'clock in the morning. The woman, who is a Jamaican, died on the scene from a head wound in an apartment. Her identity has been withheld pending notification of her next of kin in Jamaica. A town hall meeting on use of the stretch of land between St. David's Christ Church and Six Road St. Philip has heard strong calls to make sure agriculture is not sidelined. Monday evening's meeting at St. Patrick's Anglican Church was called by the Town Planning Department because of the number of development applications it has received for the area. Sir Frank Allen and MP James Paul were among those making passionate pleas that good agricultural land should not be used for property development. Sir Frank is one of the consultants on the project. The packed audience included Chief Town Planner Mark Cummins and former Christchurch MPs Reginald Farley and Bobby Morris. Because we have a habit of approving things that is in this country and the environmental impact assessment is nowhere to be mentioned. Not only that, we cannot even verify the authenticity and veracity of the statements that even that I'd like to make in that. That's the first point I read. Most of the land along there is presently used for agriculture, and I've seen them with carrots, cronuts that they love, sugar canes, um, food products, the salmon, yam, the sweet potatoes, and I think it should be maintained for agriculture. Are we going to have this place? Yes. But we are not living in 1900. And the start we are with the 21st century. And we therefore have to look at the complexity of where we're moving. Not up in the point of food security and all that. Make your provisions for that. This is what we're looking at, like, that area. We're not looking for the whole of Barbados. There are all kinds of places in Barbados that are not that area that we're looking at. That is the area we're looking at. The, 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 the cows. The, the, the poultry and whatnot, you're going to push these to one side because they're going to say we're smelling, we're downwind, we're smelling and therefore you can't keep. I, I, I want to see Barbados continue, at least the area, continue as it is. And I do not like the idea of building, you know, these wall houses or these construction uh, monstrosities to Take away from me my food base. Thank you. Workers at the company which does most of the repairs to buses at the transport board will likely be paid on Wednesday in a move which may ease industrial unrest. The UCAL workers who withdrew their labor from the board for two days last week had threatened more protest action if they weren't paid on Wednesday. But a spokesman says it expected that the deadline will be met, at least in respect of this week. UCAL has been laboring under what officials say is a near $20 million debt by the Transport Board. Major HIV research encompassing 5,000 scientific papers on Barbados and the Caribbean is now available online. The Virtual HIV Research Unit is a collaboration between the Ministry of Social Care, the University of the West Indies and the National HIV AIDS Commission. It can be found on HIVGateway.com. Mention the term chemical weapon and it's likely to scare many of us. You know, those chemicals formulated to inflict death or harm on human beings. Well, you might be happy to hear that the Barbados Fire Service and other emergency response agencies have been receiving training in chemical weapons response skills from the International Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. In fact, 17 people so far, the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of the Environment, Edison Aline, has told a Caribbean seminar. Sadema's Joanne Passard said that the Caribbean was regarded as the second most vulnerable region in the world because of its exposure to hurricanes, earthquakes, and volcanoes. But its chemical emergencies were also noteworthy. 
In news about our neighbors now, a public officer in Dominica has been awarded more than 300,000 Barbados dollars in damages in a wrongful arrest lawsuit. Patrick Carbon, who works at the country's financial services unit, filed the lawsuit as a result of treatment he received after he'd been arrested in August 2006 on a charge of human trafficking, which was later dismissed. After pleading not guilty, he was jailed for 14 days before he was granted bail. Despite attending court 37 times over the next two years, the charges were eventually dismissed. And now, commentary from Carl Martineau. Three major sporting events recently underscored the need for better events management in Barbados. The secondary school's athletic championships, the Gold Cup, and the recent West Indies versus England cricket series passed with flying colors for on-the-field activity, but they fell short in other areas. We know that the national stadium is old and in dire need of repair, but that is no excuse for poor internet service, insufficient concessionaires, or wet bathrooms. It was great to see hundreds at the Garrison Savannah for what could have been Patrick Husbands' last race, but not if, as a media practitioner, you couldn't make a simple phone call or get on the internet to tell the world who won the race because the bandwidth was overloaded. And what about the much-publicized snubbing of Desmond Haynes at Kensington Oval? Simply unacceptable. Quite frankly, if we expect to reap the benefits of sports and entertainment tourism, we have to be on point in every area. In sport, defending champions West Indies qualified for the semi-finals of the World T20 after an 84-run victory in the make-or-break clash with Pakistan. The Windies progressed after bowling their opponents out for just 82 in a contest which was effectively a straight knockout for the one remaining place in the last four. Dwayne Bravo with 46 and Darren Sammy who made 42 were the stars of the show as West Indies recovered from a shaky start to post a total of 166 for 6 after winning the toss and choosing to bat. The target proved too much for Pakistan. Samuel Badri returned in figures of 3 for 10 from his four overs as the 2012 winners booked a semi-final date with Sri Lanka in Dhaka on Thursday. It was a hard-fought win, especially um, getting to the target we did, um, fought the ball well. They dominated in the first uh, 12 overs of the match, but um, brilliant finish by, by myself and Bravo. Um, Bravo especially, he played a, a very good knock and, um, you know, the bowlers can't, can't stop um, commending them on, on the effort they've put in in this tournament, um, especially Santoki starting with a brilliant Yorker and um, Badre, who is the number two bowler, most economical in, in, in T20 cricket, you know, and he bowled all his, most of his overs in the power play. So all in all, it was a good team effort and um, that's those sort of performances we're looking or these sort of performances will help us to win, retain the title. They joined the West Indies women who had already qualified even though they lost by nine wickets to India in their last match. The West Indies women will be also in action on Thursday when they play Australia. Pine Hill St. Barnabas are in the hunt for three of four knockout titles at the Netball Stadium on Wednesday. They are in the finals in the Intermediate 2, Junior Knockout and the Senior Knockout. The most eagerly anticipated match is of course the Senior Knockout at 8pm, a rematch of last year's final against Spooners Hill, which St. Barnabas won by one point. And finally, media reports in Britain say a killer in prison is to become the country's youngest granddad at the age of just 27. The convict's daughter is said to be 13 and was born when her dad was 14. She has now become pregnant by a boy who is believed to be the same age as her. The girl's dad fatally knifed a bystander who tried to stop a robbery when she was two years old. And that ends Nation News for Tuesday.